Any theory as to what happened to Earhart and Noonan must answer two questions. First, why did they not find the island? And second, why were they not found by the subsequent search effort? It is known that Earhart's radio signals became stronger as she approached the island, but then were not heard at all. So we know they got close to Howland, but not close enough to see the island or the ship, despite the ship making smoke. This photo was taken from a helicopter during an expedition to Howland. The island is in the field of view, but among cloud shadows, showing how difficult it would be to find it. To figure out what happened, we can analyse the radio reports to work out how they approached Howland and what search pattern they employed. The six degree track error is plotted to the left to conform to the trade winds and by fitting a search pattern on the Howland Sun Line in a way that misses the island by 20 miles. But first we must understand what is a sun line. The sun line is a line of position calculated after observing the time of sunrise with a chronometer. It is not a case of shooting the sun with a sextant. At sunrise observation is difficult because the sun is rising fast and there is distortion due to refraction in the atmosphere. A dead reckoning position close to the time of sunrise is plotted on the chart. The time and direction of sunrise at the dead reckoning position is calculated using the almanac. Draw the first sun line through the dead reckoning position at 90 degrees to the direction of sunrise. In our case the direction is 067 degrees true, which gives the sun line 157337. Next, note the time when the first rays of sunlight emerge above the horizon. Correct the timing for the height of the aircraft above sea level to give the time of sunrise at sea level. Compare the actual time of sunrise with the calculated time at the dead reckoning position Time difference is converted to a distance using the speed of the terminator, the Earth's shadow, moving across the surface. Using that distance in an east-west direction, draw a second line of position parallel to the first. That is the line of position at the time of sunrise, but your position could be anywhere on that line. Where the second sun line crosses the dead reckoning track is the most probable position, MPP. Finally, recalculate the head or tailwind component, draw a third line of position through the destination and calculate a new ETA. This is the 157337 line that Earhart referred to. This method can correct for timing, but in our case the tracking remains a dead reckoning calculation. As they approached Howland, what were their options to search for the island? If they failed to observe the sunrise and calculate a sunline, the only option would be to continue with the dead reckoning heading and timing, and then do an expanding square search or a ladder pattern search. In this case, there will be no reason to mention the sunline on the radio. However, Earhart did refer to the sunline, and then there were two options either an offset approach or a direct approach. An offset approach is used when the destination is on a line feature, but the navigator is not sure if he is left or right of track. The track can be offset by a distance greater than the likely track error, and then when reaching the line of feature, or in our case the sun line of position on timing, the navigator knows which way to turn to reach the destination. The offset will look similar to that seen at the beginning of the flight to avoid weather. 20 degree offset over 200 miles will give a 67 mile offset. The problem with this is that it was 1400 miles since their last fix at waypoint 4 and a 3 degree track error would put them 70 miles off track. Without a coastline to follow, offsetting the wrong way could make them mess the destination altogether and would have been a risky strategy. What can the radio messages tell us? At about the estimate for Howland, Earhart reported, we must be on you but cannot see you. And later she said, we are on the line 157337. That would be the sun line through Howland. If they had deliberately offset the approach track, then they would have intercepted the sun line first and would not report we must be on you when they were 70 miles away. 
so they probably did not make an offset approach. All the time they were expecting a homing signal from Itasca. Their best option was a direct approach, but that would then require searching both north and south on the Howland Sun Line. The radio calls in this case should be 200 out, 100 out, on you but cannot see you, then on 157337 north and south. That is what was heard by Itasca in that order. Therefore, they must have done a direct approach, descending to 1,000 feet in preparation for landing. With three hours fuel remaining, how should they have searched for the island? There was no point in deviating from the sun line, but which way should they turn, north or south? A suitable strategy would be either to go one hour north and two hours south, or go one hour south and two hours north. That would cover the sun line 120 miles north and south approximately. If they had gone north first and then south, and they were already 140 miles north of track, that would have put them 260 miles north before turning south again for two hours. The radio signals received by Tasca would have weakened and then strengthened again. They would have ended up 20 miles north of Howland and would have been back in radio range again. They would have ditched close to the island or they might have made it on their last dregs of fuel. But none of that happened. Once they descended below the clouds, the wind could be measured using the drift site. If Noonan recalculated the wind after plotting the sun line and with drift to the left, he may have had an idea that they might be north of track. He probably chose to go south first. With the summer sun over the Tropic of Cancer at 23 degrees north, when they turned south they were looking down sun and avoiding the glare. How do the radio messages fit into this scenario? Earhart's radio schedule was to transmit on the quarter and three quarter hour and listen out on the hour and the half hour, but she never gave times with her position reports. The reported times are the times the message was received by Tasca, so it is now easier to refer to Tasca local times. The 200 out call was important to give Tasca notice to make smoke corrected dead reckoning estimate for waypoint 10, 200 miles west of Howland, was 0605 local. At 0615 local, Earhart reported about 200 miles out approximately, probably after noon and got the sun line and the wind velocity. This gives a revised estimate for Howland of 0800 local. This means that the flight plan estimates are not too far out. 30 minutes later at 6.45 local, she reported, Please take bearing on us and report in half hour. I will make noise in mic, about 100 miles out. But they could not have flown 100 miles in 30 minutes. The ETA for 100 miles out should have been about 0700 local, but that was the time for listening out, so that Earhart probably tacked the 100 out call onto the previous transmission. At 7.41 local, the original ETA for Howland, Earhart reported, KHAQQ calling a tasker. We must be on you but cannot see you. Gas is running low. Been unable to reach you by radio. We are flying at 1,000 feet. But they could not see the island or the smoke from the ship and they did not know if they were north or south. At 7.57 local, she reported, KHAQQ calling Itasca. We are circling but cannot hear you. Go ahead on 7500 with a long count either now or on the scheduled time on half hour. This was the ETA for Howland revised after calculating the sun line. Given the limited view from the aircraft, it made sense to fly a circle to thoroughly visually check the area. But with an accurate sunline, there was no point in circling and drifting downwind or doing a square search. It was essential to remain on the Howland sunline 
correcting for drift so the best chance of finding the island or to be picked up after ditching. She asked for Itasca to send a signal on 7500 kilocycles, which they did. Two minutes later at 758 local, she reported, PHAQQ calling Itasca, we received your signals but unable to get a minimum. Please take a bearing on us and answer on 3105 with voice. Tasca received long dashes on 3105 kilocycles, but they could not take a bearing on that frequency. During the next 30 minutes, Itasca transmitted frequently and may have blocked Earhart's 0815 local transmission. At 843 local, Earhart reported KHAQQ to Itasca. We are on the line 157337. We'll repeat message. We will repeat this on 6210 kilocycles. Or she may have said at 855 local, we are running on line 157337 north and south. That was the last message received by Tasker, although the records are somewhat ambiguous on this point. Between 0900 local and 0915 local, their one hour flying south expired and they probably turned north. They were probably only 10 or 20 miles north of Howland. Why were they unable to get two-way radio communication and a bearing? There were three direction finding sets available. The direction finder on Itasca only worked on 500 kilocycles, but Earhart could not transmit or receive on 500 kilocycles because she had removed the Morse key and the trailing aerial. There was a portable DF set on shore which worked on 3105 kilocycles, but the battery had gone flat overnight. The direction finding set on the Electra had worked on tests in Australia, but Earhart could not get a bearing with it. The dorsal HF transmitting aerial had been modified, possibly compromising its efficiency, and the ventral HF receiving aerial may have been damaged during the takeoff at Ley. She picked up Itasca on 7500 kilocycles, presumably using the Electra's direction finding loop while trying to take a bearing and while transmitting on 3105 kilocycles. At that point, they had two way communication and could have used a simple yes-no code to home in using signal strength as a guide. But that never happened. After the last transmission, if they had turned north and gone downwind, after 30 minutes they could have been about 90 miles away and over the horizon before the next transmission. With the intention of going two hours north, they could have ended up 290 miles north of Howland which would put them at the northern edge of the subsequent search effort. When we figure out what was the actual wind and how did they get six degrees off track, start by plotting the 078 degrees true direct track from Ley to Howland and the 157337 Sunline. Then fit the south-north search maneuver onto the sun line to stop short of Howland by 20 nautical miles. Then draw the deviated track from waypoint 4 to the midpoint of the search maneuver, which was about 140 nautical miles north of Howland, and that gives about 6 degrees offset. Earhart reported 200 miles out at 6.15 local, which is 17.45 GMT but they were somewhere on the 200 mile sun line, which happened to correspond with waypoint 10. The elapsed time from the revised ETA at waypoint 4, 714 GMT, to the dead reckoning position at 1745 GMT, was 10 hours 31 minutes. The dead reckoning position at 1745, using the original forecast wind, put them at point B, 59 miles east of waypoint 10. In the diagram, the triangles ABCX show the effects of the wind during this 10 hours 31 minutes flight time. 
The diagram comprises the plan track AB, 078 degrees true, the air plot AX, 076 degrees true, and the effect of the forecast wind over the same period, XB, which pushes the air position X back to the ground position B. And that's 180 nautical miles in 10 hours 31 minutes, giving 18 knots from direction 068 degrees true, the forecast wind. Line XC is the effect of the actual wind pushing them from the air position X to the supposed ground position C. That is 280 nautical miles in 10 hours 31, giving 27 knots from direction 097 degrees true. Track AC is the 6 degree north line, 6 degrees including the 2 degrees of drift in Noonan's calculations using the forecast wind, and 4 degrees of drift from the actual wind. Is there verification for the 6 degree offset track? Yes, there is. At about 10.30 GMT, the radio operator at Nauru Island heard a woman's voice make a radio report of a ship in sight. This was Earhart, possibly seeing the SS Myrtle Bank, a ship inbound to Nauru at a position about 1.4 degrees south, 166.45 degrees east, exactly on the 6 degree north deviated track. The Electra probably passed about 60 miles south of Nauru, where a new lighthouse had been installed, visible at 34 miles at sea level. They were about 120 miles north of USS Ontario. Ontario never heard anything on the radio. Seeing the SS Myrtle Bank when she was expecting to see the USS Ontario may have encouraged Earhart to think that they were on track. An unintended 6 degree track error over 1400 miles between Waypoint 4 and Howland put them about 140 miles north of Howland, far enough to go south on the Sun Line at 120 knots for one hour and still be 20 miles short of Howland. This explains how they got close enough to Howland for their radio calls to be so strong, yet not close enough to see Howland and how they used up three hours of fuel while remaining on the Sun Line. Clearly, if they had continued south, they would have seen the ship's smoke. But remember that on the approach, their mental picture was that they were close to on track and they could not commit to one direction only. They had to search north and south. How do we know the deduced wind 097 degree 27 knots is correct? The weather at the equator is dominated by the intertropical convergence zone, the ITCZ. Solar heating causes air to be drawn in from north and south. In the southern hemisphere, the south wind is deflected to the left by Coriolis effect, producing the southeast trade winds. In the northern hemisphere, the north wind is deflected to the right giving the northeast trades. Although Coriolis effect is neutral at the equator, its effect is to generate rotation in air masses at mid-latitudes, which in turn affect the winds at the equator. The wind squeezed between high pressure areas north and south of the equator will be essentially an easterly. However, because the Earth's axis of rotation is tilted, the ITCZ moves north in the northern summer and the sun is not over the equator, but is over the Tropic of Cancer at 23 degrees north. The southeast trade winds then push north of the equator. This is not an absolute condition, since the wind will be affected by local effects and tropical storms. Nevertheless, a northeasterly in the northern summer is very unlikely. The southeasterly is much more reliable. That's why they call them trade winds. Also, there is a clue in the weather reports. This information has been there all along, but appears to have been overlooked. The sea level pressure was slightly lower at Howland, 28.83 inches of mercury, compared with Nauru, 29.91 inches. 
In a southern hemisphere high pressure system, with your back to the wind, the high pressure is on the left. This is according to Bayes' Ballot's Law, useful knowledge for the captain of a sailing ship. On the equator, under the influence of the southern pressure systems, when flying eastwards towards low pressure, the wind will be coming from the right, from the southeast. In the diagram, you can see that the 29-inch isobar must pass south of Howland and north of Nauru. And with the track from Ley to Howland of 078 degrees true, the wind must be from right of track, giving left drift. What happened next? Itasca set off at 10.40 local time to search the 337 position line. Sunset at Howland was 17.55 local. In the darkness they used searchlights, but the sea was rough with six-foot swells. They only got 60 nautical miles north of Howland before they turned east to search the area northeast of Howland. At 21.45 local, Itasca was ordered to return to Howland to assist the seaplane which had set off from Pearl Harbor. At 0710 local the next day, the 3rd, they were back at Howland only to be told that the seaplane had turned back to Hawaii. At 719 local, Itasca set off again, this time to search westward between the 180 meridian and Howland, the 157337 sun line forgotten. Late on the 4th, Itasca was ordered to sail north to a location 281 miles north of Howland, which was mentioned in a garbled radio message picked up by the Navy at Hawaii. They got there on the 5th and turned east, but found nothing. After this much speculation, what do we know for sure? We know they said they were on the 157337 Sunline. Forecast wind must have been wrong, otherwise they would have been on track during the approach. We know that the wind must have been a southeasterly because of the pressure information. A normal but unforecast southeast trade wind would put them left of track. We know they failed to see Howland and that Itasca did not hear any ditching call. We know Itasca set off on track 337 at 10.40 a.m. local time in daylight and saw nothing within 60 miles of Howland. They were not there. At about 22.35 GMT, after flying north for two hours with a tailwind, they were 290 miles north of Howland, out of radio range at 1,000 feet unseen and unheard. They may have had a few minutes of fuel remaining somewhere among the 12 fuel tanks. This train of logic leads her to a final ditching position at 11.05 local, 22.35 GMT, at 5.33 degrees north, 178.41 degrees west. The ditching site is plotted on the chart of the search area. Itasca arrived close to this position three days later on the 5th of July and then turned east. They had a refueling rendezvous on the 7th. After the ditching, the Electra would not float for long. If Earhart and Noonan got themselves into a dinghy, they drifted under the influence of the equatorial current plus the southeast trade winds. Itasca reported the current at 0.5 knots to the west and the surface wind was easterly 10 to 15. 12 nautical miles per day, they would drift towards the North Gilberts or the South Marshall Islands 700 miles away in about two months. Their track was just outside the search area. This explains why they were not found.